Hey. Uh, how are you? Good. How's it going? Busy. Even with everything going on, we've been busy. I can't believe I was looking back to when we first met. It was in our talk. It was 2013. I know it. I looked that up the other day. And I was like, <laughs> has it been? Wow. I yeah. know. And I didn't realize you started a few years before that, but now you're, it's like your 10 year anniversary. I'll start 2010. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be 10 years in July when we got our first shrimp. So we're planning a kind of a nice big 10 year anniversary celebration. That's really great to know that y'all have like persevered and grown and you know. And we're getting to grow again. So yeah, are you open by the end of this year to add 24 more production tanks? Wow. We're selling shrimp faster than we can grow it. So and I don't have, like telling people we don't have shrimp. You have 36 right now? No, right now I have 19 production tanks, but we have 10 nursery tanks and seven intermediate tanks. Okay. So we need to add more of the production tanks on so that we can sell more shrimp. The nursery tanks we're doing great with. I mean, we're still doing an 80 to 90%, 95% survival rate in our nursery. So, Yeah, that's one of the big things that you guys started doing, right, was providing the yeah, other farmers, yeah. yeah. Mainly in Indiana or? Oh, no. Like I said, even when all of this stuff didn't shut down, we drove to Nebraska. Okay. We guys, we just set a farmer up. I mean, it was brand new. He already had all the water in his tanks. He was all ready to go. Then they shut us down. So yeah, I saw we, that on your website. You offer kind of like these turnkey, like eight tank setups for people. Yeah, we do. What we do is we call them like starter packages. I really need people in the business because I'm not naive enough to think I'm the only one that can supply shrimp. But I want to be able to go to a restaurant and eat shrimp again. But right now I don't. Yeah. I know where it's coming from. I've actually got to visit several countries that our shrimp comes from. I won't eat it. But yeah, we are working on um, helping to set up farmers. We've actually, this is the sad thing. I mean, we ended up setting up about 50, 48, 50 shrimp farmers over the last six years. But we've lost probably half of them. Just. And they, everybody thinks it's easy. They think you just throw uh -huh. the shrimp in and they grow. Yeah. You know, I mean, we've had, we lost a lot of them at six months and I get this excuse. Well, we're just not making any money. You're like, seriously, you're not making any money at six months. Oh, I am totally shocked by that. Yeah. You're livestock. Yeah. You're no form of livestock. Do you make any money your first couple of years? Yeah. But with our system of the trip, because we actually changed the system in 2015 or excuse me, 2014, we designed our own system at that point. We okay. run on air only. We have no pumps, no filters, none of that. We run on air only. And we've been able to manage to keep our water for 10 years. So we've managed it. And so that's the system we sell people, which is a lot cheaper than what most of them are used to getting. Hmm. So we can sell you an eight tank system with just about everything you need, minus the building for about $100,000. Wow. So, I mean, we spent over almost a million dollars for us to get in with six tanks. So That's, huge difference. You guys started with six? We started with six production tanks, yeah. And they were with a one horsepower pump that weighed about 70 pounds. Wow. Down every other day. That's why we designed our own system. I got so sick and tired of those things breaking down and we lost shrimp after shrimp. Mm. So after about five years, that's when you developed your own. It took us a couple of years to develop it. And what we developed is actually, it's, it's so primitive compared to a lot of other things that we go and visit. Sometimes I tell my husband, I said, I feel like we're back in the prehistoric days, but it's working. Because mm. I always tell everybody, Mother Nature's complicated enough. Let's just work easy with her. And that's all we do. We just kind of maintain the water. And as long as the water does good, my shrimp do fabulous. And that's a concept people don't get. Yeah, how much kind of coaching do you guys do you guys give when you give them their eight? We offer consulting. We work with them every single day for the first six months. Oh wow! So we do what we call an ongoing learning because I can't train them here anymore because our water's so far advanced that we're so far advanced that whatever they need to do, we can't do it here to show them how to do it. 
So when we deliver the first batch of PLs, we spend three to four hours with them, training them at their facility. Mm. And every day they do their testing, they send their testing results to me. And then I tell them what they need to do and explain to them what they're doing and why they're doing it. So they get an ongoing learning education for the first six months. After that, we still will work with them daily if they want us to, but they really don't want to. But if anything ever arises, we're there for them. Mm. Even if it's six years down the road. Our second farm we ever set up was actually in Switzerland. Oh, yeah? And they're still up and running. They're still doing very well. Well, other than this right now. Uh, and they just added 21 new tanks. Wow. And they said they can't sell their shrimp to anybody because they're on lockdown. Mm. So, but yeah, they're still doing very well. And, but <clears throat> they had a problem not about two months ago. They called us and it was fine. We'll, we'll answer your questions at that point. Do they have a system set up that they can, you know, take the shrimp out and freeze them and stuff like that? Or are most They try not to freeze them just like we do. Okay. Because they have, in Switzerland, they have a lot more stricter policies than we actually do about freezing products. Mm. So they're trying to avoid that at all costs right now. And what, about, and what about you guys? So non-corona um, times, are you guys selling to restaurants and retailers and individuals? Like, what's that breakdown? Right now, um, the restaurants we do from time to time if we have the shrimp available. But since our retail business keeps getting bigger and bigger, that's why I need to add more tanks, we pull from the retail and the grocery stores. Um, we had two restaurants, which right now, they get it periodically, which we were selling it to them weekly for about two years. Um, one was the Palmer House, and the other one was the Marriott on Lakeshore Drive. And they loved our product. They kept yelling at me because I limited how much they could get. Mm. Well, my thing is, I mean, they would call me and they want to place an order for 100 pounds. I'm only going to give them 30. I might give them 35. Because if they order 100 pounds, they're not going to sell 100 pounds in two days. Mm. Yeah. Then they're going to freeze it. Well, now the product's not as good. People aren't going to want to buy it, which means they're never going to buy it from me again. I want them to keep buying from me. So they, they learned to live with that. They put it on a, a like a weekend special and it would have our name associated with it and that they were local grown. And it's actually was beneficial to us because we actually got a lot of customers from them. Yeah, I'm sure. People from Chicago would drive down to our place. We're about an hour and a half from Chicago, two hours, depending on traffic. And they would drive down here and they say, oh, we had your shrimp at the Palmer House, so we had to come and get it. But yeah, and so the grocery store we were in, we were in there for about a year and a half. And then... At that time, we were roughly selling maybe about 400 pounds retail, but all of a sudden, all these people just started coming in, and then it was like, people are driving two hours to come and get my product. I've got to make sure they have the product. You know, the restaurants, they can wait. So, so I have about a- To individuals. Mostly, 99% of ours is to individuals. Wow. I mean, today alone, we've already done 52 pounds. And you have it set up so you're able to harvest continuously, essentially? Yeah, we, run, we go through five tanks a month. And we use the, most of my facility is 14-foot tanks. And they produce about 120 to 140 pounds every three months. So five tanks, that gives me just a little over 700 pounds that we can harvest out of. Three months grow, that's pretty quick. Well, they're uh, 25 days in nursery, 25 days in intermediate, three months in production. Total 150 days. And when they're at about 150 days, they're weighing anywhere from 17 to about 22 grams in weight. And that's what we sell them as. And the fact that we sell them live yeah, um, kind of helps us out a little bit. And, you know, I never even really wanted the concept of selling them live. I actually like the idea of processing them. But we were down at a farmer's market, and there was a guy two booths down from us selling what he called flash or fresh frozen shrimp and he tells me his are fresher than mine and mine are alive and swimming <laughs> and i'm sitting here looking at him like really <laughs> mine are swimming and what we found out about six weeks later that he was actually going to like a restaurant supply house buying a shrimp and putting his label on it hmm. and you know and we're and i'm sitting here thinking you know i would have never in a million years ever thought of that but I thought, you know what, when people, we, we don't harvest them until they place their order. When they see that they're still swimming, they know the freshness of the product. So, so you have the, 
what you're growing and then you have what you're kind of setting up for people and then you have your plants like what is the kind of breakdown of what you spend your time on and how you're making your money well we also do tourism we we don't really advertise our tourism other than what's on our website and this year was the first year we actually had a lot of school tours scheduled we had 19 of them for the end of the year and they all got canceled because the schools shut down so we you know we lost all of those uh, but they all are planning on doing them when school comes back which is fine yeah. um, we also do what we call like i said our discovery tours which are people are interested in shrimp farming um, we just we did crawfish for the last four years we were very successful at that oh yeah but, I saw that on your site and it's a different kind of crawfish than the australian red yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're the Australian red. Um, very sweet. They're almost, they can actually grow the size of a lobster. Mm -hmm. A lot of our brood stocks were almost the size of lobsters. Wow. And then we had, um, we just got rid of all of them about two months ago because we've got to redesign the system that we were using. They were just too aggressive and we need to figure out a better way. Um, and so we were spending too much time on them. So we just got rid of them. But we did just bring in oysters six months ago that's exciting now i'm raising oysters and um, we've actually got five different experiments going on because nobody's ever raised them indoors and nobody will talk to me about it everybody says that it can't be done and that's just one of those things i really hate that term it hmm. can't be done because it hasn't been done right i don't care they told me i couldn't raise shrimp indoors i've been doing it for <laughs> 10 years so i'm like please don't tell me that so we're doing the oysters we got them in six months ago now granted it takes about two years before you see or do anything but yeah, it's, you know, they're not the fastest growing thing on the planet, but we're raising some of them directly in with the shrimp tanks. Okay. So we're using the oysters as another filter for our bacteria water, but we're also running, raising some of them in just plain clear water. Um, we're, we're designing kind of a uh, uplift filter system, not a normal, just using air stones. We're actually using PVC pipes thing to keep the algae in constant movement because I don't have an ocean water in which to do that with. So we're having to manufacture it all ourselves. And so that was just kind of to improve the system or do something new or just try it, you know? I just wanted to try it. Yeah. Well, I'm doing 70 to 90% survival rate in my shrimp. Our normal swimming pools, we do anywhere from 85 to 92% survival continuous. Wow. Where's my challenge? <laughs> <laughs> Need a new challenge, I like that. I have these three fiberglass tanks that we always do 72 to maybe 80% survival rate. So, I mean, we know that's where they're going to be. So not much of a challenge there. I needed a challenge. I would love to do my own hatchery, but everybody we've talked to about the hatchery is so expensive. And then I have to, to break even in 10 years, I have to sell 5 million PLs per month. Not enough shrimp farmers to sell that many. I was curious back when I, First talked to you in 2013, I think I made a map of um, the shrimp farms in the U.S. and they were about 19 or something like that. What, do you know the number now? You're still, we're probably at 22. 22. Okay. Yeah, like so, I said, we've set up 50 of them and we've lost half of them. Right, so it has grown, but not that many have stayed. Still in. The, the ones that are in it are the ones that started about three years ago and are doing great. And they are all expanding right now. Um, most of them are running anywhere from 14 to 19 t production tanks right now. And those are in the Midwest? or They're all in the Midwest. We're talking between Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Idaho. So, yeah. And then we do have one in Washington. Um, his is a little, I'm not for sure what's really going on there because I've lost contact with him for the last year. Um, he was raising his, uh, part of his facility, they were raising pot. And so the other part was where they were raising the shrimp. And he had, he was under so many rules and guidelines. And yeah, there was one down in Florida, um, in Felsmere. Did you know any, anything about that one? Was that the organic shrimp farm, yeah. the big one, the long raceways? Yeah, we actually hoped that they would have made it because at least they were doing the bioflock system, but then that would be shrimp in grocery stores that people would get to understand. Right. But we knew that after six months when they shut down tourism, we knew something was wrong. 
But we understand using BioFlock in the raceway systems, it just doesn't work. That's why nobody stays in business. Mm. They needed $40 million to continue on. Mm. And they couldn't get the $40 million. So, yeah, I was kind of sad. Um, like I said, well, Marvesta, the first shrimp farm, they actually used the raceways, but he no longer uses raceway. He actually uses a system very similar to ours. Actually, when when I went up there for our shrimp film, I think they were using the tank system like y'all's already. So yeah. Well, do you know any any of the farms that sh ship nationally? I mean, none of them that I know. Of. I know that the one in Minnesota. I know that that's their goal, and I know there's one in Texas that ships nationally. Oh, natural Other shrimp, maybe. That. Yeah, natural shrimp. So most of our farmers are still considered. I mean, they're we're still small in scale. Uh, but most of them are selling to, they're selling, most of them are selling right out their front door. Yeah. I mean, back when I was doing more research into this, it seemed like there, that was the big kind of gap. It's like the smaller farms and then just scaling up to be able to provide, you know, in a, in a bigger way, it just wasn't happening because people weren't willing to make the long-term investment or I don't know. Well, going in, this is what well, I can tell you, this is what's going on in Indiana. And we're actually working very closely with Purdue and NICRAC right now or in the Sea Grant. Um, one of the things we have a problem with in Indiana is the restaurants don't want our product unless it's processed. I can't process it. I have no way to process as it. As far as headed and peeled? They want the head off and they want it deveined. That's the only way they'll take our product. Well, in order for me to process it, there's a processing plant that said that they would take my shrimp in Kentucky. Mm. Well, Kentucky is about four hour drive. So now I got to haul it down to Kentucky and then I got to haul it back. Not worth it. Cause I mean, you know, that's going to end up costing about 30, $40 a pound for shrimp. There is a mobile processing plant, uh, a mobile process processing like trailer. Um, they charge you $170 a day. Plus, you have to clean it. You have to supply gas. I mean, it was just outrageous. It's like, well, for the cost, you can do that. I'll just go and rent one myself. That was That's just in Indiana or? Yes, yeah, just in Indiana. Um, because like I said, a lot of the states. Now, which is totally amazing. We can take our shrimp to Illinois. We don't get asked a single thing. They love the fact that it's live. Because our restaurants get the product within three hours of us harvesting it. Mm -hmm. But the restaurants here in Indiana have an issue with it. Mm -hmm. They want it processed and frozen. And frozen. And they want it and frozen. So that's the problem we have with Indiana. So um, we're actually hoping within the next probably four months, we're going to put together, if I can get my crap together on my end, put together a um, Iron Chef type thing using the, the shrimp oh, cool. as a secret ingredient and using the, the chefs from Indianapolis and you know, the surrounding areas the top chefs. And so put them in a competition using the shrimp. Because so, the thing a lot of them don't cook with fresh shrimp. So they don't know. Yeah. And if you haven't, once you've had it, it's like, there's no, there's, there's nothing a else. Back. <laughs> yeah. There isn't. I can't eat shrimp out. There is, there's a huge flavor difference. In it. And that's how our retail does. I mean, like I said, we don't advertise. Our, all of our business is word of mouth. Well, and it, if you, could you ever go into grocery stores? I mean. Yeah, we were actually in a grocery store. Um, we had a long conversation with this particular grocery store. The owner and their manager and their seafood guy all came down. They wanted 100 pounds a week. They said, you're not getting it. I said, I'll sell you 100 pounds a week, but we're going to make a delivery every other day. I said, I will give you 30 pounds every other day. Oh, no, no, no. We all wanted it one time because, of course, they didn't want to pay the delivery fee. It was $75 because they were two hours away. So I said, sure, no problem. And so finally they took it and it got so bad that we would actually, my son, when he would deliver it, he hated it because they always called him the shrimp boy. There would be at least five to eight people standing there waiting for the shrimp to be delivered. They just took it out of, they just took our packaging and then they just handed it to the customer because they were already prepackaged in one pound and they would just hand them off to the customer. They would put their little sticker on it and pass it off. And they said they sold out every time within about four to five hours wow so they want so we actually moved our day so yeah selling in the grocery store, but they had to pack it on ice but one of the things that the only reason we agreed to do it with this grocery store was that if any shrimp was left over 
they would cook it and then sell it as a cooked product. So they always had, they, they said only the first time did they ever have shrimp left over. They said after that, they literally had people wanting to know when it came in. They knew what day it came in on and they were waiting on my son. So basically like maintaining that brand image of that super quality fish or shrimp is y'all's biggest it's part. It's very of important. Yeah. yeah. Well, because we've got, we still got to distinguish why ours is better than what they buy in a package. Because a lot of people to this day, when I go and do lectures, they'll say, you know, they'll ask me, how much you sell your shrimp for? $18 a pound. Well, I can get it for 14 at Walmart. Yeah, you can. But you actually know what's in it? You know, that's fine. You can buy it. It's frozen, minor, fresh. You know, it's your choice on what you want to do. Yeah. So, yeah. And so that's the only way we can still differentiate. When people see it with the head on, that's the only way you can guarantee the freshness of the product. Because yeah. the head only lasts for two days. So that's why it's so important to us. Yeah, I mean, when I add the next 24 tanks, yeah, we're actually looking at doing a processing. We're looking at going to different ways of processing, you know, manufacturing it so that we can, but I still want to sell the fresh product. I actually have a goal that I would love to set up like a, a distribution center, not at our place because we're too far out of the way for everybody, but do something like centrally located like Indianapolis and then have the shrimp farmers bring their shrimp in live to us. Mm. And then we pack it on ice and it's out on a truck within a matter of an hour. That and then you know, on a four or five hour drive, they're getting a very fresh product. And yeah. that is my goal to do that so that we can distribute the shrimp out. And about how many farms would be participating in that, you think? Hopefully about 10 or so. Right now there are five of us in Indiana. There are four in Ohio, and then I have three in Missouri, um, two in Kansas, and four in Nebraska. If I go, if I just take it here in the Midwest, we got and, one that's going up. Have a relationship with most of those guys. Yeah, yeah, we all still keep in contact with each other. Um, if they ever have a question, they know to call me. If they're not for sure how to sell something, or if they see something in their shrimp, they contact us. So what are, what's day-to-day -day operations like? It sounds like pretty small family run. There's only three of us that work here. My husband, myself, and my son. Oh, wow. The, like I said, our day-to-day -day is we get here first thing in the morning. We do our testing. There's nine, thing that we t nine things that we test for still every day. Um, but it, we're done in about three hours with all the testing, cleaning, feeding, getting everything done. Then the rest of the day is for tourism and for research or anything else or weighing the shrimp cleaning the tank cleaning the facilities that's that's what we do in the afternoon because our retail business is open from nine until five okay we do have a part-timer he is a purdue student so what are the nine things that y'all test for every day Dis dissolved oxygen temperature salinity ph ammonia nitrite alkalinity co2 and bioflock so five of the tests are done with a meter. So, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Now we still use the hand meters. Um, I, when we add the 24 tanks, I am going to have to go to automation. Um, so this, uh, we've got one automatic system right now. Uh, we got somebody that's developed another one. So we're waiting for the protocol on it or the prototype. So we have about three different versions we're going to use, but we're going to use them on the same four tanks. Because I've seen to where the automatic testing, the bioflock distorts the answers. Hmm. So I need to know how much they fluctuate. So we're using four tanks with these uh, three systems to see. Plus, we'll still hand test. So if we can get a variation, we know that this one's always off 0.2 on DO, then we know how to calibrate and go from there. So that, I mean, it's going to be about a six month process, but it's going to take me a while to build these two buildings. The two new buildings are actually going to be geared more for tourism. They're um, going to house uh, 24 production tanks and all the production tanks will be 16 foot round tanks, which hopefully we should produce anywhere from about 240 to 260 out of every harvest. Um, we're also going to have a garage on it. So when we sell our PLs, the, drivers can drive their trucks in and not have to stand outside like they do right now. 
So I have a nice place they can come in. And we're going to have the intermediate barn on the end of that. But everything is going to have glass walls. So we can do like self-guided tourism that they can walk through without actually having to walk into the facility. That's super cool. Yeah, I was wondering about biosecurity with right now when people come in, do you have, you know, kind of a foot bath type of situation? Or? We don't use the foot bath. Well, we're actually Indiana Livestock certified and biosecurity is one of their big things. I mean, you get like this 800 page manual, I think 400 of it was on biosecurity. We actually got a lot of the rules changed for my facility. Hmm. One, I don't want people bringing chemicals into my barn because if a shrimp jumps out and we've just walked through them with chemicals on our feet, my son comes up behind us. He doesn't know where we've been. He picks up that shrimp, throws him in the tank. We've just killed that tank of shrimp. Hmm. So for us, but we do use hand sanitizer. Uh, the people are not allowed to put their hands in my tanks. Um, we really don't even allow them to touch the tank. So they have to stay back a ways. Um, we do have one tank in which we do allow them to touch. We have what we call shrimp fishing. Uh, <laughs> Cool. We have these poles with hooks, and we use our Dutch <laughs> shrimp fish bay. And they get to go shrimp fishing. Yeah, video. Video. That, that sounds hilarious. It is so fun. The college students are the best. They scream the loudest when they'll catch something, then they'll get it halfway up, and then it just falls off. And they're like, oh! And you know, the fact that they caught it, it it's just hilarious to watch them. Preschoolers, oh they're just, they're, they're too intimidated by it, but when they finally try it, yeah, so we have one tank that we do let them do shrimp fishing at. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Once everybody leaves, we in turn wash down the floor using vinegar and water. Mm. So we do go through and we scrub the floor after they've gone through. Which the last couple of years have been a little rough. I mean, we have the hatcheries were shut down for almost five months, six months. Why? Due to a disease, I cannot pronounce it, but it's kind of like, it's called early mortality syndrome. Hmm. About seven years ago, it hit all the shrimp farmers around the world. Anything that was raised outdoors just killed off 90% of the shrimp. When they hit about 10, 12 grams in weight, they just died. Um, so they've, been, they've got a name for the disease. They know how to find it now, but they don't know what causes it or how to cure it. So the hatchery in Texas, Global Blue, um, they got theirs were tested and they found two shrimp that had it or two PLs. So they shut them down. And then uh, American Panade in Florida, they voluntarily shut themselves down. They cleaned. They, now they've got all these new protocols that they have to go through now. And uh, there, so there was five months we didn't get PLs. And it was actually at the worst time ever for us. Last year at Easter, we normally sell about 700 pounds of shrimp per month, but for whatever reason, the four days leading up to Easter, we did 422 pounds of shrimp in four days. Wow. Just retail people walking in wow. the door. Now that's on top of my normal 700 pounds. We were out of shrimp. We were literally out of shrimp. So anybody walking in last year, we're like, I am sorry. We had, we were like, we only had a hundred shrimp in a tank just to keep the bacteria alive. It was a struggle. And then we get them up and going. We just got them back in December. We started this all over again and now we're shut down again. So, well, in the year before that, we had the hurricanes. Yeah. Both Texas and Florida were hit and SIS went out of business. They're not, are they, they do brood stock only. Okay. They will not sell PLs. I got to work in a couple of hatcheries, but they both, both have been overseas. Mm. I got to work with one in Vietnam, and I also got to work with another one in China. So not the best places to learn, but it was, it was a learning experience. I, that's why I said That's why I really want to do my own hatchery. But the cost of it, that's why I'm kind of hoping if I get the oysters to take off, they'll balance out the cost. At least I'm hoping. Hmm. And so then when you're going to have the 24 new tanks up and running by? Hopefully by 2022. Okay. I love what I do. And so to me, yeah. it's not work. I enjoy getting up and coming over here every day. I enjoy all the people we get to meet. I mean, yeah. I would have never thought. And like I said, if you would have asked me 10 years ago about working a shrimp farm, I'd be like, <laughs> no way. I mean, like, no way, no how would I ever wanted to do this. Yeah. But I came out on day two and I missed three days of work. 
Mm -hmm. in 10 years. Yeah, you love it. I do. I love it. I love coming out here. I love making sure, I don't know, maybe it's that little OCD partner that I have. <laughs> it has to be a certain way. We've had employees in the past and they just made me a nervous wreck. They really did because I never felt like they put or cared about the animals. Yeah, I, I, it was, I'm curious about that. Yeah, people who aren't like necessarily as connected to, you know, the, the idea of, you know, growing these animals, you know, are they going to have the same attention to detail and all that? And I mean, like, I always tell everybody, I work for the shrimp. They don't work for me. I mean, I got to do what they want. We're doing really well here. I mean, surpassed anything we ever thought possible, to be honest with you. And everybody's like, you're still, and I still eat shrimp three nights a week. Three nights a week, yeah. Three nights a week. Um, I, cause I still like, it. I try different experimentations on how to cook it, but a lot of times I'm so tired. I just throw it in the skillet. Yeah. It's so easy. It is. And that's why a lot of our customers keep coming back. And on average, a lot of them drive two hours. That's amazing. To come and get a product. We have a lady who comes down every other month and she lives in Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. And she drives six hours one way to come get our product. And she doesn't, I always say we offer 10 pound discount. If you buy 10 pounds, I'll give you $2 off. She only takes two pounds. Wow. Six hours for two pounds of shrimp. That's a 12 hour drive. I said, I love my shrimp, but I'm not even going to drive it. <laughs> that is so cool. I know. it, And that's why I said, that's why I like the retail side of this, because these are the people I get to meet. Yeah. Restaurant people, you get to see a waiter and that's about it. Yeah. You drop off the shrimp and you're out the door. But they get to know a little bit about these people. And that's why I like this side of it. My husband hates it. He hates the retail side of it. Well, think about it. If I sell shrimp every Thursday, I get a check. There might be three or four days where we don't sell any shrimp. And then the following day, we put 100 pounds out in four hours. Yeah. That's a lot of dipping of shrimp. Yeah. Because we don't drain our tanks in order to dip the shrimp. We hand dip them. Less stress on the shrimp. Yeah. Keep the shrimp. Happy. I need them alive. They make me money. Yeah. So I tell her, I said, I need my shrimp alive. They make me money. And now we actually make money on our dead shrimp. And that's another part of our business we can't keep up with. We sell all of our suiciders as bait. I get $6 <laughs> a pound for my dead shrimp. When we first started out, I had 300 pounds about every month available. Now we can't even get 10 a week. And I get people yelling at me because I don't have bait available. I'm like, I don't kill them to make them bait. That's a good problem to have for sure. It's, not the it's always here. exciting around here. Never the same day twice. <laughs> yeah. That's, I think that's why I like it. It's never the same day twice. God, my always, hair. Always crap. a challenge. Always an adventure. It is. And that's why I like aquaculture. I would have never thought there's always something new. Always something new. Like I said, raising the crayfish. Now doing the oysters. If I can figure out the oysters, I'm hoping to go to scallops. Ooh, I love scallops. That'd be I do too. Really and I love oysters. That's why I was all excited. I just want to do the oysters for myself. Right. And I'm actually pretty proud of myself. Right now, I have 18,000 oysters at our facility, or I have a little less, but overall, I've only lost 400. It's great. And when did you, how long? You, We've had them for six months. Six months, okay. I don't know what I'm doing, but they're still alive. For me, doing the research on it's the fun part. Yeah. That's the part. I, I always tell my husband, I said, maybe I was meant to do research because I really do like the research, trying to, you know, learn as much as I can from them and digging into what I can find out about oysters. Well, it sounds like you've been problem solving a ton too. So that's all I can do. That's what I like to do. It's exactly what I like to do. I love, love problem solving because that's what I always think. That's how you, you're never bored. Mm -hmm. That's how things get done. I go to Purdue University. There's four different classes that I speak at twice, twice a year. And two of them are agriculture. One of them is food nutrition and the other one is water. I'm still not quite for sure why I'm over there for the water side of it, but I do. But we also have the FFA students come through here. And last year we had 1,400 FFA students in four days. They did their tours. They were stacked on top of each other from 8 o'clock until 5 o'clock in the evening. Wow. Now, what I've loved is that right after they left in October, 
I had five students call me with their parents. They came out to learn about shrimp farming. They wanted to add it to their business as well. Uh, most of them were doing dairy cows. And then we also find out that a lot of these students are in agriculture, but they've changed their majors over to aquaculture, knowing now that there's another side of farming. So, yeah, especially in the Midwest, I can imagine, you know, you guys don't have a ton of aquaculture in general, right? I mean, no. But what's amazing, Indiana is one of the largest aquaculture states. Now, because of the shrimp farming? Not just due to shrimp, there are a lot of fish farms. There are a lot of fish farms in India. I think there's like 30 different uh, fish farms in the state of Indiana, including a couple of um, fish hatcheries. But tilapia and... Tilapia, barramundi, trout, um, bluegill, koi. Um, we actually have salmon now here being raised in Indiana. Um, oh, is it the aqua... Bounty? Yeah. We still call it bell aquaculture because that's what they used to be. Mm. Um, yeah, they're, they're quite an interesting group. I don't know. I think it's cool on one hand, but I also don't like it on another hand. I mean, their whole purpose is just to raise the salmon faster, yeah. not better, just faster. Have you, and, how do folks locally feel about it? Have you heard much? Most of them don't even know about it. Yeah. Most people don't even know about it. Only a few of us, even in the aquaculture, because my husband and I both are on the board of the Indiana Aquaculture Association and they, you know, I actually mentioned it to the board and they were all like, what, really? Really? I'm like, yeah, they had this huge news article about it. Uh, we're actually going to talk to them about come Christmas time. We would like to offer some of their salmon here hmm. at our facility for, so our, for our customers to come in. Uh, we're getting some uh, trout that's uh, being processed in Kentucky. We're going to bring in some live tilapia and some live bluegills to sell also. But then I will have to have my health inspection. I'm already food server certified. I've just kept it from working in the cafeteria. We already have our HACCP plan, so I just need to get the approval of the health department. To, to be able to sell those different species? No, just to be able to process it, mm. to have it processed and sell it. So Because the fish, we want to process it here. Like I mean, if I sell tilapia, I like the idea of picking out a fresh fish. I love the idea. You know, it's in my tank. I know how healthy it looks, but I don't want to take it home and gut it. I yeah. did that a lot when I was a kid, when we'd go fishing with my dad. So we're actually, we're working with Purdue University, some of the students that are culinary students, what better skills for them to learn? Filet of fish. Definitely. So as an add-on cost, we will offer the person to have a filet fish. But yeah, when we became livestock certified, we, we were the first aquaculture facility in the state of Indiana to do that. Now, almost every aquaculture facility is livestock certified. Why? What's the... The livestock certify is just that next step. It's kind of like a good housekeeping seal. Okay. Um, it gives you... It actually... It was really one of the best things that we ever did. It actually made us think outside the box on a lot of things that we never would have thought of. One of the main things most farmers never think about, fire. Mm -hmm. Your building's on fire, what are you supposed to do? And, and we learned a lot by that. One of the things that we actually, we have a post out front that has our sign on it. Well, on that post is a bright yellow neon PVC pipe. Inside it is our floor plan. The fire department knows exactly what that is. So they know where all of our chemicals are stored uh, for the farm, for the greenhouse. They know where all of our tanks are at. So that when they come into our facility, instead of just letting it burn, they know where everything is. And we had to meet with the fire department. So they all come in once a year and they get a tour of the facility. And like I said, I mean, we actually asked them to point out anything that might be wrong so that we know to fix it. And so far they haven't found anything. We invite the health department in once a year, even though we don't have to, because there are no rules or regulations for us. But all the farms that we set up, they act as if we do have the rules. Mm. Because in our manual, this is the stuff we talk about. And if I ever walk into their facility and see it, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. Because I always look at it this way. You know, I mean, you hear about the catfish farmers where one catfish farmer took a shortcut and how people don't want to buy farm-raised catfish. I love farm-raised catfish. I think it tastes better. You know, but people don't, they have that perception of it. 
So my problem is if anybody ever sells subpar shrimp, it doesn't hurt just their business, it hurts mine as well. Absolutely, yeah. So this is why I'm very cautious about everything we do. And that's why I make sure that all the fish farmers are just as well, because you got to build the standard so people understand. And having the livestock certification, it's not easy and not everybody gets it. So, Well, and people already have such a kind of finicky relationship with farm seafood anyway. So, you know, building they, trust is important, you know. That's why we try real hard to do what we do. So, and I'm very protective of the shrimp. So I always tell people, I don't care if I didn't set you up or not. If I see you cutting corners and you're selling subpar shrimp, I'm going to let you know about it. I still want to be 90 years old and still selling shrimp. I don't want that one person to take that away from me. I'm, I'm too competitive. Well, you did say whenever I first met you that you wanted to make Indiana the shrimp capital of, you know, I still do. I still and do. I was kind of like, oh, that's funny. <laughs> I still do. I really do. I, that's still one of my things I'd like to do. But lately, we really haven't had too many people from Indiana coming to look at shrimp farming. We've actually had them from Nebraska and everywhere else. But still, the Midwest, you know, you get some of the most yeah. incredible, delicious shrimp in the U.S. pretty amazing. It is. And like I said, we're also working in Canada right now. Um, we've got, we've been working with, we're working with a farm in Nigeria but we're working with India. We've also um, Nigeria. Then we've also got the one in Switzerland, Germany, and Spain. We uh, the one in Germany. He just closed up. Um, he just wanted to retire. It was so good to talk to you, Sarah. I'm glad I got to talk to you. I'm glad to catch up a little bit. Yeah, and um, let's keep in touch. I will. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. All right.